When the earth quakes, all hell breaks loose. Oh my god, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. They strike with lightning speed, a huge bolt of destruction. These forces baffle experts who are on a desperate mission to predict when and where the next big one will hit. With each earthquake, you have things that you didn't predict before. We'll circle the globe, examining significant earthquakes of our time, each more powerful than the last, each with its own compelling mysteries, each propelling us towards a projected mega disaster, a monster quake that could rock our world. Earthquakes are one of the most destructive and unpredictable forces on the planet. Without warning, solid ground cracks, shifts and buckles, threatening anything in its path. It's estimated that several million earthquakes shake the planet every year. Most are barely detectable tremors, but at least once a year, somewhere on the globe, a major event strikes. Most earthquakes are created by movements of titanic slabs of the Earth's crust, called tectonic plates. Enormous pressure builds as the plates strain against each other. When plates slide past each other, a strike-slip earthquake forms. When plates collide head-on and one slides under the other, a thrust earthquake occurs. In both cases, the Earth's crust tears and snaps, releasing a giant burst of seismic force. The amount of energy released by an earthquake is known as its magnitude. The higher the magnitude, the more energy released. An earthquake of magnitude 8 or higher releases as much energy as a billion tons of TNT, or 67,000 Hiroshima bombs. Earthquakes' destructive energy has cost almost 8 million lives in the last 1,000 years. The fatality rate is rising as populations in high-risk areas increase dramatically. And it's kind of an inevitable shift as people cluster more and more. The, the largest cities continue to grow larger and larger. Today, there are 17 cities jammed with more than 10 million people. 140 other metropolitan areas have populations topping 2 million. More than half of these are within striking distance of a major fault line, placing hundreds of millions directly in the line of fire. A lot of times, we are our own worst enemies in terms of where we build and how we build these cities. It's only a matter of time before another city is hit by a devastating earthquake. To prepare for the inevitable future, it's essential to learn from the past. October 17, 1989, San Francisco, California. For 15 horrific seconds, the city by the bay is rocked by a magnitude 6.9 earthquake. The epicenter is near a mountain in Santa Clara County called Loma Priata. Suburbs close to the mountain suffer serious damage. The ground splits open in huge gashes, hundreds of homes are thrown off their foundations, and small communities are ripped apart. People were dead. But bizarrely, the greatest devastation and loss of life is 97 kilometers to the north in Oakland and San Francisco. The quake brings down a section of Oakland's Cypress Expressway, turning a busy freeway into a graveyard. Oakland okay. firefighter Lorenzo Frediani is one of the first to respond. It was a horrible scene. It was such a large-scale disaster. Seeing huge pieces of the freeway on top of cars, fires beginning to erupt, everyone just yelling and screaming for help. 
Frediani and other rescuers race to find survivors. They fear the worst, that thousands are dead under the shattered remains of the expressway. This was at five o'clock approximately. This is its peak time. There should be bumper to bumper traffic. So when I saw the cypress unfold in front of me, all I could think about was how many thousands of people would be dead. But amidst the horror, there is a life-saving stroke of luck. The earthquake hit as the two local baseball teams, the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland Athletics, faced off in the World Series. Millions are watching the game, and traffic is much lighter than usual. The fact that we had the ball game between the two Bay Area teams easily saved thousands of lives. As rescuers desperately try to free those trapped on the Cypress Expressway, another disaster unfolds across the bay. Nearly 200 buildings in the Marina District are severely damaged or completely destroyed. Fires started by broken gas mains add to the damage and panic. Stunned residents flee into the streets, but even as the marina suffers catastrophic damage, neighborhoods surrounding it escape almost unscathed. Seismologists like Jack Boatwright struggle to understand the quake's selective destruction. The ground motion and damage in the marina was a surprise not just to um, the lay people, it was also a surprise to seismologists. The earthquake seemed to defy logic. It targeted two specific areas, 97 kilometers from the epicenter, leaving most of the Bay Area untouched. Boatwright and his colleagues set out to solve this mystery by going back to basics. When a fault ruptures, spherical waves of energy are released, traveling through the ground until they reach the surface. Like any other kind of wave, they can bend, reflect, or join together to make bigger waves. Oakland and the Marina District were unlucky enough to be hit by a seismic double team, two sets of waves that join together. One set traveled directly from the earthquake center to the surface, Another traveled deep into the earth, then bounced off the boundary between the solid crust and the molten layer beneath it. The reflected waves reached the surface 97 kilometers away from their source, directly under Oakland and the Marina District. This seismic double whammy was bad enough, but it became much worse when combined with a fatal mistake made by the city's forefathers. A hundred years ago, this land didn't exist. As the Bay Area rapidly expanded, stretches of ocean became beachfront property. The shallow edges of the bay were filled in with sand and debris. The difficulty is these very fine and clean sands. When an earthquake occurs and you start shaking them, there's really nothing binding the sand together. It becomes actually a liquid. Liquefaction is a deadly side effect of many large earthquakes. As solid ground turns to liquid, roads are destroyed, buildings topple, and underground pipes rupture. Liquefaction severed a gas main in the marina, igniting an inferno. The total cost of the quake was huge. 63 people died, 4,000 were injured, and 20,000 structures were damaged or destroyed. For seismologists, the 6.9 Loma Priata quake was a brutal wake-up call. They were surprised by the reflection of seismic waves that struck the Marina District and Oakland. With each earthquake, you have things that you didn't predict before. Every earthquake is, in fact, a learning experience. But the 1989 Loma Priata quake was not the worst to strike San Francisco. The same side effects of liquefaction and fire killed thousands when a much bigger earthquake struck, destroying most of the city by the bay. Around the turn of the century, San Francisco was actually the premier city on the west coast of the United States. The city featured luxury hotels and modern high-rise buildings. 
but in 1906, many came crashing down. The earthquake occurred about 5.12 in the morning on April 18th, and when it occurred, it essentially occurred without warning. A loud roar jolted thousands out of their beds. Seconds later, a giant shockwave hit the city, shaking buildings to their foundations. The West Coast's economic and architectural center lay in ruins. At the time, seismology was in its infancy, and the quake's cause was not well understood. We now know the city was caught in the middle of an ancient battle between the Pacific and North American tectonic plates, an infamous war zone called the San Andreas Fault. These mighty slabs of crust are scraping past each other directly beneath San Francisco. When sections become locked together, enormous pressure builds up and is released as a strike-slip earthquake. In 1906, 435 kilometers of the fault ruptured. A magnitude 7.8 quake released eight times more energy than the 1989 event. The first and fastest waves released by any earthquake are primary or P waves. They act like a sonic boom, shaking the ground and rattling windows. A few seconds behind are the secondary or S waves. These carry most of the earthquake's energy and are the most destructive kind of seismic wave. In San Francisco, the S waves tore huge gashes in the earth and ripped apart building foundations like paper. But it was another side effect of the earthquake that sealed the city's fate. Liquefaction of the ground severed gas and water mains and San Francisco began to burn. Without a water supply, the fire department stood by helpless as the city burned to the ground. The descriptions of the fire are, they actually refer to this as a fire storm. And in a fire storm, the heat is so intense that it actually sucks in air. The fire raged for three days, incinerating 10 square kilometers, destroying more than 28,000 buildings and leaving a quarter of a million residents homeless. More than 3,000 people were killed. The 1906 event proved that an earthquake's complex side effects can be more devastating than the quake itself. 80 years later, a bigger earthquake crippled a city 45 times larger than San Francisco. The key culprits, a totally different seismic side effect combined with disastrous city planning. But even that quake is dwarfed by a potential mega quake, an event of enormous power and consequence. The San Francisco earthquakes of 1906 and 1989 showed how reflection and liquefaction can have tragic consequences. In 1985, one of the largest cities in the world was crippled by an earthquake with even stranger and more unpredictable effects. It proved that where you build a city is as important as how you build it. Mexico City is one of the world's largest cities with a current population of more than 20 million. The metropolis sprawls across a mountain valley in the center of Mexico. It's a city of non-stop activity, its massive population busy day and night. On September 19, 1985, dawn breaks on a typical autumn morning. Millions of people face the new day. Suddenly, the earth begins to writhe and buckle. A magnitude 8 earthquake strikes the city. The epicenter is off Mexico's west coast. It unleashes six times more destructive energy than the 1906 San Francisco quake. Hundreds of multi-storied buildings disintegrate into rubble. Thousands of others are severely damaged. I didn't know what was happening. Your mind is racing a thousand miles per hour. You don't know if you're already dead. 
The city struggles to cope as phone and electricity lines are severed, emergency services overwhelmed, and millions left to fend for themselves. Three of the city's largest hospitals are severely damaged, adding to the chaos and casualties. One of the most horrific scenes is at the Nuevo Leon, a 15-story apartment building. Of the 1,800 people who lived here, more than 600 were killed. Quatemec Avarca is a stunned witness as the Nuevo Leon falls victim to the earthquake's rage. I recall it like a nightmare because uh, this huge structure, so solid for us, in those moments uh, it was collapsing like if it was made of uh, paper, like a model that an invisible hand was pushing down. Potomac and dozens of his neighbors rush to the demolished apartment building and with their bare hands begin a desperate struggle to rescue survivors. There was a survivor, he was trapped by the debris. We couldn't move the um, concrete above him. It was so, so heavy. I was uh, holding the right hand of this man, uh, trying to encourage him. He was complaining, this is so painful, it hurts. And uh, he died. The death toll is estimated at anywhere between nine and 35,000. The true number may never be known. Why was this mighty city victim to such devastation? Mexico City is in the center of the country, hundreds of kilometers away from the earthquake's epicenter. And why were some areas practically annihilated while others were left untouched? For seismologists like Sina Lomnitz, this disaster would change their understanding of seismic waves. There are various surprising factors that intervened to cause this particular earthquake to be a disaster. The quake was triggered by movements of the Cocos Plate, which collides with the North American Plate off Mexico's west coast. Unlike the San Andreas Fault, where two plates are sliding past each other, Mexico is the scene of a tectonic head-on collision called a subduction zone. Normally, one plate slides smoothly under the other, but when a section becomes stuck, enormous pressure builds up in the rock. On that fateful morning, the pressure finally becomes too much. A section of the Cocos subduction zone rips apart, blasting a massive shockwave of seismic energy towards Mexico at thousands of kilometers per hour. During most earthquakes, the greatest damage occurs close to the epicenter. This one is different. Coastal areas suffer some significant damage. But Mexico City, located 322 kilometers inland, bears the biggest brunt of the earthquake. Bizarrely, most of the city is barely damaged, while small, specific areas are almost completely destroyed. Buildings between 6 and 15 stories high suffer the most. Shorter and taller structures in the same block survive virtually unscathed. To solve the perplexing mysteries, Lomnitz and his colleagues searched directly beneath their feet. Mexico City has a rather unusual location for a large city. 700 years ago, what today is Mexico City was a lake. The Aztecs built their capital city, Tenochtitlan, on an island in the middle of the lake. It was a massive complex of canals and causeways, with a structure as complex as any European city at the time. When the Spanish conquistadors captured and totally destroyed Tenochtitlan, they filled in the lake and constructed their own city directly on top of it. Centuries later, this turned out to be a very bad idea. The uh, sedimentary layer on which the downtown area is built 
is a layer of very soft clay. It's practically a jelly. It's almost water. This ancient lake bed holds the key to the earthquake's strangely selective damage patterns. Over the first three days after the earthquake, we realized that uh, severe damage, structural damage, had only occurred on the former lake area. The layer of soft lake bed was not just unstable, it acted like a seismic amplifier, trapping seismic waves and actually boosting their strength. Just like jelly will keep wobbling long after you shake it, the layer of mud under Mexico City continued to shake for four minutes after the earthquake. This is the major cause of the disaster. But that didn't solve the mystery of why buildings between 6 and 15 stories suffered the most damage. The answer came in the form of another destructive combination of seismic waves and loose sediments, a phenomenon known as resonance. Every object has a certain frequency that makes it resonate. If a singer hits the right note, they can shatter a glass just by subjecting it to its unique resonant frequency. Even a large object like a high-rise building can resonate. Depending on its size and structure, there is one energy frequency that will make it vibrate. By incredibly bad luck, the seismic waves trapped and amplified by the layer of mud under Mexico City were exactly the right frequency to make six to 15-story buildings resonate. The buildings began to vibrate, shaking themselves to pieces. Others smashed into their neighbors like battering rams. These freak circumstances doomed Mexico City. Many important facilities, such as hospitals and schools, were in the fatal size range singled out by the earthquake's fury. The Mexico City quake was a tragic example of the dangers of building on soft or reclaimed land. The unstable soils amplified the quake's effects and unleashed complex and deadly patterns of resonance. Today, buildings cannot be constructed on the unstable lake bed. Building codes and civil emergency plans are enforced to help prevent future disaster. The people of Mexico City know they're at risk from earthquakes. But millions of others live in striking distance of rare, mysterious quakes and don't even know it. And we're moving closer to an even bigger quake, a potential scenario that will combine liquefaction, fire and other deadly side effects in a brutal mega-disaster. San Francisco and Mexico City both fell victim to earthquakes spawned by the volatile boundaries between tectonic plates. Half the world's large cities are within striking distance of major faults like this, but the other half are not necessarily out of danger. There is a totally different type of earthquake. These rare rogue events strike seemingly from nowhere, ravaging areas thought to be immune to earthquakes. January 26 is India's Independence Day. But in 2001, the celebrations are forgotten when a massive earthquake strikes the western province of Gujarat. The 7.7 .7 quake destroys the historic city of Buj, along with many other nearby towns and cities. 20,000 people are killed and a million homes lost or damaged. 200 villages are wiped from the map. Paul Bowden is a Memphis, Tennessee-based seismologist who traveled to India to study the quake. What we saw was an immense amount of devastation. The uh, human toll was incredible. It was a horrible place uh, 
to actually be doing the work that we had to do. For scientists like Bowden, the most stunning aspect of the quake is not the scale of the damage, but the fact that it occurred at all. According to the theory of plate tectonics, this earthquake should not have happened. Central Asia is no stranger to deadly quakes. Over a billion people live close to a massive tectonic collision as the Indian plate plows head on into the rest of Asia. The Himalayas, the largest continental mountain range on Earth, are the crumpled wreckage of this collision. This volatile plate boundary has spawned numerous deadly earthquakes. The 2005 Kashmir quake killed almost 80,000 people in Pakistan and northern India. It was magnitude 7.6, not huge, but powerful enough to flatten hundreds of thousands of buildings. But Bhuj is 200 kilometers away from the dangerous Himalayan plate boundary. Large earthquakes shouldn't happen here. But there's these, these rogue 5% that happen away from plate boundaries. And we don't have a very good understanding of why, of what drives these kind of earthquakes. These mysterious rogue disasters are called intraplate quakes. The 2001 Bouj earthquake was an important opportunity to study one of these rare events. But Bowden and his team had a more urgent reason to travel from Memphis to India. The largest intraplate earthquakes in history happened right in their own backyard. In the winter of late 1811 and early 1812, the Midwest of the United States was torn apart by a swarm of massive earthquakes. They were probably bigger than any quake to hit California and are named after an ordinary town with an extraordinary secret, New Madrid. The magnitude of each can only be estimated since seismic recording instruments didn't exist, but there is no doubt they were huge. The first, estimated at magnitude 8, hits on the 16th of December, 1811. Houses and buildings are torn apart, entire forests are wiped out. Enormous cracks split and tear the earth. The placid Mississippi becomes a raging torrent of rapids and waterfalls. But this was only the beginning. A month later, another giant quake, estimated at magnitude 8, tears the frontier town of New Madrid, Missouri, to pieces. Two weeks after that, a third magnitude 8 quake strikes. Over the next two months, almost 2,000 smaller tremors strike. The effects are felt throughout the entire eastern half of the United States. In New Madrid, in the middle of the plate, to have a large earthquake, a huge earthquake, is astounding. And then to follow it up with two other events that were as large or larger, just incredible. This incredible series of earthquakes seems to have come from nowhere. This is the flat, stable center of the North American plate. It's supposed to be safe from large earthquakes. Real Foot Lake, 24 kilometers from New Madrid, is famous for its fishing. But seismologist Roy Van Arsdale hasn't come for the largemouth bass. For him, Real Foot holds the key to unlocking the mystery of the New Madrid quakes. 200 years ago, this lake didn't exist. Well, this uh, serene swamp and lake area was uh, rocked severely during the winter of 1811, 1812 in a series of three giant earthquakes. It was the third one in March that is responsible for the formation of this lake. Real Foot Lake's peaceful appearance is deceptive. Beneath its calm waters, scientists have made an earth-shattering discovery. 
There's micro seismic activity, meaning little earthquakes are occurring all the time out here. So there are seismometers planted in the landscape around us, measuring, recording these earthquakes. Deep under Real Foot Lake and New Madrid is a mysterious fault system that spawned the huge earthquakes of 1811, 1812. It continues to generate small earthquakes today. But this discovery raises even more questions. If the New Madrid fault is not a plate boundary, then what is it? The answer to that lies far away in Ethiopia. This is part of Asia and Africa's Great Rift Valley, a fault system that stretches 4,800 kilometers from northern Syria to Mozambique. The earth here is splitting apart and bleeding molten rock. A tectonic plate is being torn in half and pushed apart, a process called rifting. 500 million years ago, this almost happened in the peaceful plains of the Midwest. A surge of magma spewed up from the molten interior of the Earth, eating through the crust beneath the ancient Midwest. But before the plate was completely split, the magma retreated, leaving behind vast cracks in the Earth's crust. As pressure builds up on this fault system, it's released as massive earthquakes. A similar failed rift has been found near the city of Bouge in India. The buried rifts under Bouge and New Madrid solved part of the mystery. But there are still many things scientists don't understand about intraplate earthquakes. They have no idea what triggers these rogue disasters or where they will strike next. We really don't have a good working model for what drives these intraplate earthquakes. This is still quite the mystery in seismology, geology that uh, a number of us are working on and uh, we just don't have an answer to that right now. In 1811 and 1812, the New Madrid earthquake struck sparsely populated areas. Today, millions of people living in cities like St. Louis and Memphis are within striking distance of the New Madrid fault system. If it wakes again, the human and economic toll will be devastating. It would be foolish to think that it couldn't happen again, that it's over. There's nothing, there's no scientific evidence that um, whatever is giving rise to these earthquakes has gone away. The New Madrid quakes were the largest intraplate earthquakes in history, but they pale in comparison to a massive tectonic rupture that ripped through Chile, producing the largest earthquake on record. And even that catastrophe is not the worst case scenario. Experts believe a giant earthquake lies in wait, one whose shock waves will ravage a nation and shake the entire planet. There is one earthquake that towers over all others, one so massive it changed the shape of a nation and killed people half a world away. This is a staggering event that rates as the largest on record. In the small Chilean town of Mao Jin, life is quiet and simple. Its 1,500 residents depend on the sea and the soil to survive. But in 1960, both elements conspired to decimate this peaceful place. Juana Lopez was eight months pregnant when her world was torn to pieces. I was at my sister's house and felt a movement. Immediately I realized it was an earthquake. Nelly Gallardo was also caught by the earthquake's violence. We couldn't stand up. We had to sit down and hold to our fins. But the fins were moving like this. Then the earth started to open. But the shaking in Maojin is just the beginning. A massive catastrophe is spreading across Chile, killing thousands and shaking the entire nation to its core. 161 kilometers off the Chilean coast, the small, dense Nazca plate slams into the much larger and lighter South American plate, creating a subduction zone. This is far more dangerous than the one that affected Mexico in 1985, because here it runs the entire length of the continent.
On May 22, 1960, the Nazca subduction zone spawns the largest earthquake ever measured by scientists, a massive magnitude 9.5. The amount of energy unleashed is equal to 32 billion tons of TNT, or more than 2 million Hiroshima bombs. The intense seismic waves tear apart cities caught in their path. Buildings topple, the ground turns to liquid, landslides sweep down mountain slopes, and cliff fronts collapse into the ocean. The city of Valdivia, close to the epicenter of the quake, is besieged. Almost half the city is reduced to rubble. But this is just the beginning. The fault rupture sets in motion a chain of events that ruins lives for generations and permanently scars the landscape. Today, Valdivia is once again a thriving city, a strategically important point of a meeting of three rivers. But take a closer look, and there are secrets beneath the water. Mysterious streets that plunge into nowhere, drown foundations and ghost-like ruins along the river's banks. The 1960 earthquake did far more than shake things up. It forever changed the shape of the land itself. This ruined landscape is the victim of a side effect of the massive Chilean earthquake called subsidence. Valdivia's fate was sealed hundreds of years before the quake. For centuries, pressure built up along the boundary of the two great tectonic plates off Chile's coast. The South American plate began to slowly bulge upwards under the strain. When the fault ruptured in 1960, the strain was released on the South American plate. It snapped back to its natural shape, lowering a vast swath of land two and a half meters. For the people of Valdivia, this is a disaster that will last for generations. Most of this area before the 1960 earthquake used to be pastures, high quality pastures. The ground dropped two meters down, and now the tides uh, cover every day this this land so there was a huge damage on the economy of these people here because they lost the soil the better soil of the area over 200,000 square kilometers of Chile's coast subsided after the earthquake but incredibly even this was not the most deadly part of the day they said we need to be prepared because the sea is coming in the tsunami is coming, and we have to climb up the hill. Just 15 minutes after the massive quake, a series of giant earthquake-generated tsunami waves slam into the coast. Some are 18 meters high. From her vantage point on the hill above Maojin, Juana watches as half the town is washed away. The waves were coming in, trying to imprison us. We heard another wave coming, starting to move the houses that were on the shore, making them hit one another. It was a terrific noise, a noise that scared us. But Nelly Gallardo had no time to get to safety. She was caught by the full fury of the waves. As the wave was advancing, trees and other things were disappearing in its path. I climbed up into some trees, but when the second wave came, the trees were not strong enough to hold us. So I jumped onto a log and tried to hold on and keep my face out of water. Then a boy climbed onto the log too. 122 people from Mao Jin drowned that night, but somehow Nelly survived. The giant waves wreaked havoc far beyond Chile. They radiated out from the fault rupture, striking other unsuspecting Pacific locations. 15 hours after the earthquake struck, the tsunami reached Hawaii. The port city of Hilo was devastated and 61 lives lost. 
Seven hours later, the tsunami hit Japan, killing 122 people. The Philippines and the west coast of the United States also felt the waves of destruction that day. When it was all over, the great Chilean earthquake killed 2,000 and left 2 million homeless. It remains the largest earthquake on record. But records were made to be broken. Scientists believe another giant earthquake lies in Chile's future, one that could be much, much worse. The evidence pointing towards a mega disaster lies on a remote section of coastline in southern Chile. This was once a big forest until the 1960 earthquake and tsunami devastated the area and left only twisted stumps. To the trained eyes of geologist Marcos Cisternas, this deserted beach holds vital clues to Chile's seismic future. The 1960 event wasn't a unique event. Although it was a giant, it wasn't unique. In this uh, outcrop, you can see there is a, a soil, a buried soil here. This is 1960 soil covered by a tsunami sand layer here. And below that, you can find another soil corresponding to the 1575 earthquake. Along this coast, there is evidence of another dozen earthquakes that ravaged the area in the last 2,000 years. So it is certain that in the future, another earthquake, giant earthquake, is going to strike central Chile. When it strikes, it will be an ultimate disaster, an event that will cripple the country and send shockwaves around the entire planet. In 1960, the biggest earthquake ever recorded rocked Chile. Thousands died, and the landscape of the country changed forever. But scientists believe a far more destructive quake could be on Chile's horizon. Don Windler is an expert in modeling disasters of the future. Using data from the giant 1960 quake and input from some of the world's leading seismologists, Windler and his colleagues have created sophisticated models of potential earthquakes in Chile including the ultimate worst-case scenario. There's no stopping the Nazca Plate from going underneath South America. We will continue to see large events over time in Chile. It's just a fact of life. The massive 1960 earthquake struck in the center of the country, where the population was relatively light. But if the Nazca Fault ruptured further north, near to Chile's largest cities, a major catastrophe would result. We're going to expect to see a lot more uh, economic loss, a lot more casualties resulting from this event. Valparaiso is one of Chile's major ports and home to its navy and houses of parliament. The city sits in an amphitheater facing the ocean. Most of its 270,000 inhabitants live on the steep hills above and are carried to their homes by unique machines called funiculars. Just up the coast from Valparaiso is the tourist resort of Viña del Mar, famous for its beaches and luxury hotels. Valparaiso and Viña del Mar are both part of Chile's most valuable stretch of land. If hit by a major earthquake, the nation would be ravaged. Just that one area from Valparaiso across the country through Santiago, metropolitan area, contains over 50% of the property value for the country of Chile. And any kind of event that has significant, serious damage to that area is going to have repercussions to the economy of the country. Windler's nightmarish scenario begins 27 kilometers under the earth 
and 80 kilometers off the coast in the collision zone between the Nazca and South American plates. A stress point snaps, starting a chain reaction. More than 1,400 kilometers of the subduction zone rip open like a zipper. Massive seismic shock waves spread from the rupturing rock. The primary waves speed out at 29,000 kilometers per hour. The arrival of the P waves in Valparaiso feels like a long sonic boom. Windows and buildings shudder. Some of the P waves shoot up into the atmosphere, emitting a frightening roar. The secondary waves follow, carrying most of the earthquake's energy. Some surface waves shake the ground from side to side, twisting railway lines and shattering concrete structures. Buildings are shaken from their foundations. Unstable areas of the cliffs surrounding Valparaiso collapse, taking many buildings with them. Below, in the port, sediments amplify the seismic energy, prolonging the shaking and the destruction. Liquefaction ruptures gas mains, water pipes, and vital communication links. In addition to the deadly seismic waves, the earthquake rupture releases pressure on the South American plate. It pushes forward and flattens. Areas of the coast sink two meters. Entire structures collapse and flooding is rampant. Fires caused by broken gas mains rage out of control. As the city lies paralyzed and in ruins, the biggest killer of all is about to strike. As the South American plate is released and flicks upwards, it pushes up an enormous wave of water 967 kilometers long. Gravity quickly pushes it back, creating a massive wave, a tsunami. One side of the wave rushes towards the coast of Chile. It takes just 10 minutes to reach Viña del Mar. It hits the already besieged city with a 12-meter wall of ocean that smashes across the city. Thousands more lose their lives. The city is devastated. But the giant earthquake's deadly reach extends far beyond Chile. The same tsunami that pulverized Viña del Mar speeds across the Pacific for thousands of kilometers. Hours after the quake, huge waves strike New Zealand, Hawaii, and Japan. The west coast of the USA and the Philippines will also be hard hit. Chile's mega earthquake is now a global disaster. Taking the 1960 earthquake, this massive magnitude 9.5, and moving it closer to Valparaiso and Santiago is something that's not likely to happen anytime in the near future. It's highly unlikely. But at the same time, given what we know about Chile's tectonics and its past history, it's very difficult to exclude that from saying that it can't occur. Chile's mega disaster will probably not happen within our lifetimes. But scientists believe a major city will be struck by a devastating earthquake. We're setting ourselves up for larger catastrophes should an event occur near one of those cities. Experts agree that while it's impossible to prevent an earthquake, it is possible to prepare for one. There are really many things we don't know about earthquakes, but we do know one thing. The way to avoid disasters is to be prepared for them. When there is no surprise, there is no disaster. The danger is that if we're not prepared, if we don't prepare our cities for the hazard that exists, there'll be hell to pay. Half the world's population now lives in cities, placing hundreds of millions within striking distance of an earthquake. For all of them, the clock continues to tick on these giant underground time bombs.
tornadoes are unpredictable. Back the up! Volatile. The whole country looked like it was in a nuclear blast of some type. And lethal. I kept talking to myself, thinking, well, this is it. They leave behind obliterated towns. There were no houses left. They were all gone. And bewildered scientists. It's not an exact science. Each tornado is unique most dangerous, a few deadly. From the tremendous to the terrifying to the tragic, this is a countdown to a mega tornado, one that experts believe will devastate a major American city. ominous tornado warning comes when an apocalyptic light darkness fills the sky. These clouds are precursors to a powerful storm, a supercell. Most tornadoes form when a violently rotating column of air stretches down from that supercell to touch the earth. In general, the faster the wind speeds, the more dangerous the tornado. Surprisingly, relatively little is known about these giant killers. Scientists are literally chasing the mysteries of tornadoes across the Great Plains of the United States, better known as Tornado Alley. More than 400 tornadoes threaten to wreak a path of destruction here every year, far more than any other place in the world. The main reason? ideal atmospheric conditions. The mountains to the west, the Gulf of Mexico to the south, and the fact that there are no physical barriers between here and the North Pole means that we are frequently changing air masses from warm to cold and back again. Tornadoes are measured using the F scale. F for Dr. Theodore Fujita, who classified tornado strength by estimating wind speed based on devastation. The smallest twisters are F-zeros. They can reach 116 kilometers per hour, about the equivalent of a small hurricane. At the other end of the scale are F-5s, whose winds reach speeds of up to 512 kilometers per hour. Back up! Back up! Keep going, keep going, keep going! The tornadoes profiled here rise up the Fujita scale from an F2 that rips the roof off a house Did you see that? to an F5 that lays waste to an entire neighborhood. It, it's all leading up to a mega tornado, one that some scientists fear will ravage a primary city. One hundred and eleven kilometers southwest of Wichita lies the small town of Attica, Kansas. Just over six hundred people live here. It's a town you could easily miss. On May 12, 2004, a tornado didn't. On that day, the blue skies over Harper County fill with storm clouds. Shortly after 6 p.m., Dan Smith-Heisler heads into Attica. I uh, did some work for the banker in there. And I told him, his wife, I said, you know, it's gonna storm today. Several thunderstorms form over southern Kansas. One look at these storms tells 30-year veteran meteorologist Chuck Doswell they might be a breeding ground for tornadoes. One of the important ingredients that produces a tornado that we're pretty sure is the wind at low levels has to change direction and speed rapidly with height. We call that vertical wind shear. The vertical wind shear typically spins the air into an invisible cylinder. As the wind speed increases and rises, the tornado intensifies and the core pressure drops. Condensation from the dropping pressure builds down the funnel, creating a visible tornado. That's exactly what's happening in the southern Kansas sky. Harper County Emergency Management Director Mike Lorig gets the first tornado warning at 6.45. And when they start giving us those warnings, we listen and we say, hey, 
We need to start warning our public from there. We do not know if, if this is going to be an F-Zero or it's going to turn into the monster. In Kansas, meteorologists carefully follow the thunderstorm as it tracks towards Attica. About 7.25 in the evening, a F-2 tornado had made it to ground right up here just on this hill. The path of it was right across here. As Lorig watches in astonishment, the tornado tears the roof off a home directly in front of him. Oh my god! Oh my god! The whole house came apart! This act of violence is just one of many. The angry skies over Kansas are far from finished. We thought, okay, hopefully things are over. We got emergency crews set up for that. And then it, the storm just suddenly it took a life on its own. Storm chasers tracking the Kansas supercell relay information to meteorologists using mobile Doppler radar. They report the tornado's wind speed, location, and one other startling fact. The storm is producing multiple tornadoes. Look at that. Storm chaser Yvette Richardson seen a supercell create more than one tornado before. It can be a very dangerous situation because often people will be looking at the main tornado and feeling that as long as they're far enough away or they're, they've taken cover that, that they should be completely safe. Her team and others report seeing 16 tornadoes. They vary significantly in size and power. The biggest is an F4, roughly 160 kilometers per hour faster and with corresponding wind force about three times larger than an F2. The F4 heads straight for Dan and Donna Smithheisler's home. I was listening to the radio and the TV and they had it exactly pinpointed. They knew exactly where it was at. Knowing a tornado's path gives potential victims an average of 12 minutes warning, enough time to save their lives. The Smith Heislers get the warning, but Dan ignores it. Mesmerized by the golf ball sized hail that often precedes a tornado, he refuses to join his wife down in the basement. That scared me, and so I started screaming at him to get down, and the dog would not come down. He said, Well, sugar won't come. And she was going in the door, out the door, in the door. Dogs are smart, they know. So when I screamed at Sugar, then she came down, he came down. We started hearing this uh, popping noise. Well, we had a rack of canned goods right over there. Before. And uh, those cans were popping from the, the pressure change. I can't even It sounded like popcorn from going off over there. The tornado batters Dan and Donna's home with winds estimated at more than 322 kilometers per hour. And that's when I got hit on the head with cement or something, you know. I can still hear myself groan. All of a sudden, you're just gonna like go with it. And that's where I was when he said, we're not gonna make it. And that woke me up and I said, oh yes, we are too, you know. And you pray really hard. The savage winds rip unrelentingly over the Smith Heisler's home. When they finally stop, the couple emerge from their basement and into a war zone. And I thought, where's the car? And then my next thought was, where's the garage? The twister destroyed the couple's two-story home, five barns, dismantled five cars, and killed their dog, Sugar. The terror down there was the worst part, the terror. The Smith Heislers are lucky to be alive. With estimated wind speeds near 400 kilometers per hour, the F4 tornado easily destroyed their home. But even the earlier F2, with winds estimated at 240 kilometers per hour, was capable of ripping the roof off this home. Complex physics transform air into a lethal force, a concept scientists are laboring to understand. What we are trying to do is simulate the tornado as best as we can. So we're actually comparing the wind which we generate here with, with the uh, measurements made in the field. And, and the match is pretty good. Saka's tornado simulator is the first of its kind in the world. It uses dry ice to create a visual display of the wind inside a vortex. 
His machine can produce tornadoes up to 1.2 meters in diameter and 2.4 meters tall. It can reach peak wind speeds of 86 kilometers per hour. When combined with scale models, he's able to replicate damage much larger and faster tornadoes inflict on homes and other structures. Normally, a portion of the roof fails and, and create a hole in the building, which then the flow starts getting inside, which then creates more load on the, on the walls, and, and eventually those walls start failing. Sarka's experiments conclude that the destructive force of circulating wind in an F3 or stronger tornado is at least three times more powerful than straight-line winds. Since few structures in Tornado Alley are designed to withstand even an F1's winds, this is stark proof that even the weakest tornado is capable of causing damage. The residents of Attica were thankful to have survived the fury of the 16 tornadoes that struck southern Kansas. But when a single F4 twister strikes a small Texas town, its bizarre behavior and surprising power threatens to destroy the entire city. And later, a mega tornado strikes a major American city, something experts say will happen. In 2004, a single Kansas storm produced a swarm of tornadoes that ravaged homes, destroyed property, and terrorized hundreds. But the power and damage of that outbreak was far surpassed by the stunning force and unpredictable behavior of a single Texas twister. Tampa, Texas has had its share of luck. The town has prospered since oil was discovered here in 1921. Today, 17,000 residents work the hard soil, farming, ranching, and refining oil. But the town's location in the Texas panhandle is also its biggest flaw. This is tornado country. On the afternoon of June 8, 1995, Pampa's luck ran out. Randy Stubblefield is a lifelong resident of Pampa. In his two years as sheriff, he's seen his share of violence. But nothing compares to what he's about to confront. About uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we received a call that there was a large tornado was building on the south side of the Amarillo Highway, just about a mile and a half from where we're standing now. Stubblefield grabs his camcorder and rushes towards the twister. I watched it building on the farmland on the uh, north side of the railroad tracks, and it just started building, getting bigger and bigger. Meteorologist Chuck Doswell is also chasing and filming the Pampa tornado. The evolution of the Pampa tornado with respect to the parent thunderstorm was very unusual in my experience. I've never seen anything quite like it. What Doswell sees is remarkable. The tornado is almost standing still. Impossible to tell what's going on in there. Then, suddenly, the tornado makes a sharp right turn. This odd behavior stuns Doswell. Tornadoes move in a particular direction because they're tied to the storm that's producing them. And the storm that's producing them moves in a particular direction because it's embedded in a wind field which is pushing it in that direction. But the Pampa tornado isn't moving in the same direction as the storm. After a series of sharp turns, the twister loops almost 270 degrees around Doswell. These erratic and unpredictable movements make this a very dangerous tornado. Let's go. And I am completely mystified as to what was going on with that storm. Then it started traveling north. Get everybody inside, because this is one big sun And hit an industrial complex. Belinda Waldrop works in that complex with her father. She isn't listening to the news. I learned that there was a tornado out 
outside the building when my dad came to the door of the office I was in and said, Belinda, there's a tornado on the ground west of us. I'm curious. I said, can we look at it? And he said, oh, no, we don't need to look at it. We need to um, get under some cover. Belinda and her father dive for shelter as the twister slams towards them. You could hear the tornado approaching. It was like a gyrating woof, woof, just a churning that just got gradually more intense and louder. The lights began to flicker as the pressure was building, and then the lights went out. Whenever you first start seeing the real debris, the metal, the rooftops and all that, that's when it hit the first series of steel buildings in the industrial complex. And then an explosion. The vacuum just took me up off the floor and slammed me into numerous things and was pulling me backward like a rag doll. You're going to see some vehicles going into the air. Transport trailers and truck combinations. Now these units weigh probably 22,000 pounds empty. These were sucked up and in the tornado and were going around and around. Stubblefield and Doswell are among the few to ever film a tornado snatching up three-ton trucks. This is a massively powerful twister. One that has Belinda Waldrop trapped in its ferocious grip. When I was in it, everything's dark and I just tried to keep my eyes closed to protect my eyes. I kept talking to myself thinking, well, this is it. And at that time, I just had a feeling of helplessness because there's nothing you can do. I mean, there's no way you can stop it, you know, or make it go another direction or anything like that. And it was just a sick feeling. That dropped me out here into the parking lot and just dropped me on my back, and I could see the cloud and the tornado. It looked like a white ghost just going up and, and taking off. Belinda's encounter with the tornado is over, but Randy's is just beginning. But when I realized that he was going to go into the city of Pampa, Stubblefield jumps back into his car and races down the road, directly into the path of the tornado. One of my deputies gets on the air and says, uh, watch out, you're too close. Be careful, you're almost there. You know you're too close when debris starts coming in the car with you. I had my windows down, and, and the trash from the circulation was coming into the car with me. He's going into the city at this time. It was headed right straight for the sheriff's office in the downtown section. Well, I had, at that time, about 65 prisoners in jail. And, you know, we had a big, strong building, but this big, strong tornado. The twister strikes Pampa, destroying or damaging 200 homes and 50 businesses. Most buildings in the industrial park are ripped off their foundations. Belinda is badly injured and in shock. Of course, I was just stunned and numb. I, I really couldn't feel anything. I felt like my legs were probably broken. I couldn't get my bearings because there was no building. There were no landmarks that I recognized at all, and I was just taken back. Fearing the worst, Belinda desperately searches for her father. He was draped over a motor. He looked dead, honestly. He was limp, and he wasn't moving. I managed to scoot over close to him and started rubbing him. He woke up and turned his head, and you could, there was blood, and you could just see this white eyeball. Just, you could, just terrified look, and, and I'll always remember that, just stark. And he immediately said, help me up, help me up. And I I can't help you up, I can't get up either. Emergency workers rush Belinda and her dad to the hospital. Both are in serious condition. Five other residents also suffer injuries. Miraculously, there are no deaths. As the wounded begin their recuperation, experts study Stubblefield and Doswell's remarkable footage. To tumble a two or three ton pickup truck along the ground and then hoist it into the air, this takes incredible wind speeds, probably in excess of 150 miles per hour. Dave Llewellyn researches the strange and complex forces at work inside tornadoes. In a tornado, the wind is not just swirling around. It's actually spiraling strongly inwards. 
Llewellyn believes that once an object like a vehicle is airborne, it can be slammed to the ground by powerful center downdraft winds, then hurled back skywards by updraft winds. This brutal cycle renders the debris unrecognizable before it's finally spat out as a high-speed missile. Amazing. That was 4,600 pounds for into the crane. Scott Schiff and his team at Clemson University are studying the damage a tornado-hurled car can do. We're really testing this um, roost slab here, and this was designed to be a shelter. Um, it's about 10 inches thick of solid concrete with a double mat of steel reinforcement. So it's heavily reinforced. It's really designed to be able to take large debris impacts. Three, two, one, drop! After multiple impacts, the slab begins to crumble. So after that last impact, we now have a permanent deformation in the slab. That rebar that's down under that bottom mat there started to yield under the load. And we started to see some more concrete falling down below there. To counter multiple impacts, Schiff is designing a steel mesh net to catch loose debris. If that works, it will be a huge step forward in tornado protection. We have this terrific you know, F5 tornado. What we're looking for is that we are safe during the event and right after the event. Despite the Pampa tornado's unpredictable movements and incredible power, no lives were taken. 608 kilometers away, another Texas town isn't so fortunate when a massive F5 twister turns tiny bits of dirt and wood into lethal weapons. And later, a mega tornado, one that scientists believe could destroy a major American city. The powerful F4 Pampa tornado tossed trucks, destroyed buildings, and threatened the lives of hundreds. But just one notch up the Fujita scale, an F5 twister turns into a killer. Its weapons, specks of dirt and splinters of wood. Gerald, Texas was founded in 1909. Located 64 kilometers north of Austin, the town never fully recovered from the decline of the cotton industry in the 1920s and 30s. In 1997, a tornado threatened to wipe Gerald off the map. From the beginning, the Gerald tornado smacks of something strange. On May 27th, a supercell forms over central Texas. The Gerald tornado is memorable for a couple of things. One was it was a, it, it formed in conditions that at the time we thought were very unusual. The massive supercell lacks strong vertical wind shear, an essential ingredient in typical tornado formation. Meteorologist Bill Gallus teaches tornado forecasting utilizing a virtual reality tornado simulator. To get a tornado in nature, you need to have really two things. You need a very strong updraft or, or updraft and downdraft to help stretch the air in the vertical. And you also need to have some source of spin present. Strong wind shear usually provides a tornado with its source of spin. Before Jarrell, the conventional wisdom was that without strong wind shear, you don't get violent tornadoes. But the unusual atmospheric conditions over central Texas are about to prove the conventional wisdom wrong. Dead wrong. Here, the warm, moist air rises so forcefully, it generates a super strong updraft, creating a very powerful and dangerous tornado. As the skies blacken and the winds rage, LaDonna Peterson and her eight-year-old son leave their mobile home for the safety of her mother-in-law's brick house. I went outside and started watching the clouds outside because they were getting real thick, real dark, real heavy. And all of a sudden, I could hear in the distance because the wind had picked up the alarm going off in town. Ken Adams doesn't hear the town alarm. He's asleep. 
and the dog woke me up. And I could tell that dog was really scared. I knew something was wrong, but I don't hear well, but I could feel it. It was like a thunder that you couldn't hear, you, you know, but, but you could feel it. LaDonna's sister-in-law and young daughter join her and their mother-in-law's home. News reports place a tornado three kilometers away. My sister-in-law and I went to a window and we could actually see the tornado in the distance, but it was like it was just sitting there, just turning, not moving at all. In fact, the tornado isn't standing still. Its forward movement is clocked at a slow pace of 16 kilometers per hour. But its internal wind speeds are reaching more than 420 kilometers per hour. Now a killer F5, it descends on the women's refuge. Then all of a sudden we felt a gust of wind hit the house. We could actually see the asphalt being pulled up off of the street, up the road from us. We were sitting there and I said, God, please don't take my family. Then we felt a big gust of wind hit the house and the bathroom door flew open. And at that point, we just started feeling like mud and stuff start coming in, hay. Minutes later, when Ken Adams walks outside to see why his dog is barking, he comes face to face with a nightmare. It was so big at the base, probably a half a mile or three quarters of a mile, that I didn't realize it was a tornado. And by the time that I did realize that it was too late to go anywhere. I ran to the house, opened the back door, and as I did, the door flew out of my hands, and the roof of the house came off. I would sort of be picked up. The house would fall on me again. Suddenly, the tornado is gone. The whole country looked like it was in a nuclear blast of some type. When I first looked up, I thought I was dead. I mean, I really did. Ken is wrenched back to reality when he's forced to take in the horror that surrounds him. More than 300 head of cattle were killed or injured by the tornado. Many that survived had to be shot because of the extent of their injuries. Oh, it was terrible. There's about 300 acres over there, and, and it, most of it, you, you couldn't walk very far without smelling that old dead smell. LaDonna's family emerges from the rubble of their home and into a wasteland. Nearly every home in their subdivision is obliterated. Many of their neighbors are nowhere to be seen. Others are badly injured. Mrs. LaFrance was pinned under a tree and her daughter was laying in the mud and had some really severe injuries to her legs and her arms. It was raining and it was, she was saying it was hurting her, hitting the open wound, so the only thing I could find was a dirty blanket laying on the ground to cover her up with just to keep the rain from hitting the wound so bad. Later we found out that Mr. LaFrance had been killed in the tornado and the daughter had been crying through the whole thing wanting to know where her dad was. 27 people died that day. Half were children, entire families killed. As scientists study the Jarrell tornado, several intriguing facts came to light. The thing that, that the tornado itself was interesting for was that it was moving very, very slowly and it was large and it collected a lot of debris to where the high wind speeds associated with the tornado were there for minutes in locations rather than just for a few seconds. The tornado traveled approximately 16 kilometers per hour, significantly slower than the average 48 kilometer per hour twister. Another oddity was that most houses in the tornado's path were completely obliterated. After much study, experts found an answer. Physicist Dave Llewellyn's computer models illustrate their findings. You can actually have thousands of tons of dirt in that debris cloud at any given time. And that dirt can change the internal structure of the tornado. As the Gerald tornado passed over the open Texas plain, it picked up massive amounts of dirt, slowing down the funnel's forward movement while increasing its destructive power. I think down low, that Gerald tornado probably acted like a giant sandblaster. Llewellyn and others believe that instead of blowing apart homes with strong winds like some tornadoes, 
the Gerald Twister destroyed structures via the massive force of windblown debris. The Gerald tornado was as ironic as it was tragic. Experts advise never to try and outrun a twister. But some who died in Gerald could have escaped the slow-moving storm in cars. Experts advise potential victims without storm shelters to hide in interior rooms like closets or bathrooms. But some in Gerald did exactly that and died anyway when their entire home was swept away. Still, because no two twisters are ever the same, experts advise that the best option is an underground shelter or safe room built to specific codes. The Gerald tornado changed the way experts watch for twisters. They now view storm systems with low vertical wind shear as possible violent tornado producers. But no amount of vigilance or insight could stop the deadliest tornado in US history from killing hundreds. And later, a mega tornado unseen in modern times threatens millions. The Gerald Twister killed 27 people while changing the way experts keep vigil for potential tornado-producing storms. But there was no way to prepare for the deadliest tornado in US history, a brutal F5 that tore through three states, killing hundreds. On March 18, 1925, a single tornado slaughtered 695 people in Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. The behemoth F5 blasted a 322-kilometer path of unstoppable annihilation that lasted for hours. Survivor accounts are chilling. The air was filled with 10,000 things, boards, poles, whole sides of little framed houses. In some cases, the houses themselves were picked up and smashed to the earth. And living beings too. A baby was blown from its mother's arms. Children all around me were cut and bleeding. They cried and screamed. It was something awful. The destruction was of mythic proportions, primarily because the killer struck an extremely vulnerable population. People had very few ideas about how to deal with tornadoes. The country was largely rural instead of mostly metropolitan. And they had essentially no way to communicate with each other. The town of Murfreesboro, where more than 100 people were killed, actually was hit more than two hours after the first fatalities from the tornado. And people wondered why hadn't any word gotten down, downstream, down the telephone lines or telegraph lines that something was coming. In 1925, several million people lived in small rural towns throughout Tornado Alley. Today, tens of millions call it home. Modern communication means better warnings, but evacuating a major city before an F5 strikes is still impossible. On May 3, 1999, the people of Oklahoma City faced the worst F5 in modern history. tornado that went through Moore in southern Oklahoma City was one of the most damaging in the history of the United States, no matter how we look at the data. Late in the afternoon of May 3rd, 1999, weather forecasters in Oklahoma carefully track multiple supercell storms and then the tornado reports that begin flooding in. At home with her eight-year-old son, Dana Grimm watches the local news. We had been watching the coverage for hours. He said it just kept building momentum, getting bigger and bigger, and if you were above ground, you weren't going to make it. The storm system is intense, complicated, and growing. Weather trackers watch in awe and shock as multiple storms produce multiple tornadoes. Large tornado? Very large tornado. It seemed like just about every thunderstorm cloud that formed eventually produced a tornado at some point. And there were times when you had the main tornado happening, and then we had what we call satellite tornadoes that would rotate around it. And they're completely separate tornadoes within the same storm system. 
At about 6.25 p.m., a large tornado touches down just outside Amber, Oklahoma. Doppler radar records its wind speed at 512 kilometers per hour, the fastest twister ever documented. This is a monster, and it's hurtling towards Dana Grimm's home. And they had said that it was a mile wide and uh, just ferocious, and it was just destroying everything in its path. With the giant wall of howling wind just 1.6 kilometers away, Dana and her son hide in the closet. I remember my son, he was screaming and crying. He said, are, are we going to be OK? I said, we're going to be fine. He said, what do we do? And I said, we pray. Dana's fear turns to panic when she hears the tornado strike. There was kind of a high-pitched squeal to it. And then, of course, the sound of everything, the, the windows just blowing out. The house was shaking. We could hear the, the beams in the roof breaking. The walls just lifted up, and we could feel, feel really cold air rushing underneath. And within seconds of that, the house just blew up. And I couldn't breathe. I had sucked in so much dirt that I couldn't even breathe anymore. I thought, this, this is it. And um, I, I remember just praying that, God, if this is it, I'm ready. On the brink of death, the fierce tornado spares Dana's life by lifting her out of the suffocating dirt. When it slams her back to the ground, she's paralyzed with fear. And I realized then that I didn't have my son. So I started screaming for him, and he came running over, and it was really, it was just a miracle of God because we were both barefoot. He came running over to me, did not have one puncture wound on his feet. The F-5 continues towards the center of Oklahoma City, crossing major highways filled with rush hour traffic. As the tornado hurtles towards them, some people panic. They abandon their cars in a desperate attempt to find shelter. For a few, that decision has fatal consequences. Three people seeking refuge under freeway overpasses are killed by debris and the sheer force of the wind. Stranded cars block escape routes for many others. Shields Boulevard in Oklahoma City essentially became a huge parking lot and it blocked people from being able to escape the tornado. By the time the F-5 dissipates, 40 people are dead and nearly 700 injured. My wife worked in the hospital in Norman that night, and uh, she worked in the emergency room. They were swamped, of course. She saw some really horrific injuries. People came in covered with splinters of wood, looked like pin cushions, so much wood awful things. Many survivors suffer multiple painful wounds from being impaled by debris. Cheryl Brown studied the injuries and deaths in Oklahoma. There were also injuries that were um, related to debris being embedded inside the body, all the way from small splinters to very large objects such as two by fours. Many survivors suffered debris-related injuries because the tornado destroyed so many homes, spewing countless shards of wood and other material into the air. The Oklahoma Twister leveled nearly 3,000 houses and structures. Three, two, one, fire! 73 miles an hour. Schiff and his team at Clemson University fire two by fours at more than 160 kilometers per hour into a variety of structures to represent the damage done during a tornado. I think that the, um, the public understands that tornadoes are very dangerous. What they don't understand is that in typical construction, they have very little protection against those types of events. When debris strikes a home, it does far more damage than simply making a hole in a wall or window. Fire! It gives the tornado a point of entry. Once inside, inflowing air can rip apart walls and tear off the roof. The home then becomes part of the tornado's arsenal, further fueling the funnel with debris and making it even more destructive. This type of construction is very typical for a residential. You know, brick veneer in front of a wood frame wall. Fire! 
The missile's gone all the way through the wall cavity. Most people that have this type of house would be vulnerable to an F5 tornado. Fire! Schiff's experiments determined that for a home to withstand the deadly onslaught of debris, the brick veneer must have an eight centimeter thick backing of concrete. So this wall here would be suitable for a shelter to resist tornadoes. Most homes in Oklahoma City were brick veneer with wood frames. This common construction, coupled with the sheer number of homes in the tornado's path, increased the debris field exponentially. Dana Grimm survived with a broken back, her son with a puncture wound to his chest. I truly believe that the reason that I was thrown twice, if I had not been picked back up and thrown again, I would have suffocated because I could not breathe in anymore. Ten supercell storms spawned 70 tornadoes that spring day including the F5 that cut a 24-kilometer path over interstate highways and devastated several suburbs of Oklahoma City. It was sad. I think there were 14 in our own housing addition that died. And it, uh, it's a miracle of God that we didn't. The Oklahoma tornado caused more than a billion dollars in damage, the costliest tornado in U.S. history. Complete and total devastation. The homes that you see over here now were completely gone. It was, it was a rubble pile. If you had been in the open, uh, it would not have been a very pleasant place to be. Things would have been much worse if the tornado had veered just 16 kilometers to the west, striking the heart of downtown Oklahoma City. Even so, the Moore Oklahoma tornado and its companion twisters rank oh, as the most deadly flash. and destructive outbreak in modern history. They would be far surpassed by an F5 striking a major American city. That would be a mega disaster. One experts warn could happen. Every year, major US cities in Tornado Alley play a game of Russian roulette with massive twisters that wreak havoc there. In 1999, Oklahoma City lost the game when a giant tornado killed 40 people, injured nearly 700, and racked up costs of more than a billion dollars. Only sheer luck kept the tornado from striking downtown. Researcher Scott Ray knows the next major city to be struck by an F5 may not be so fortunate. Dallas is overdue for a large, violent class tornado. Dallas, Texas is a boom town sprawled along the southern boundary of Tornado Alley. It's one of the largest and fastest growing metro areas in the US with more than 5 million residents and 600 corporate headquarters. Dallas is 10 times larger than Oklahoma City. I was shocked a bit when I saw some of the aerial footage of Oklahoma City. The, the amount of damage that had occurred in that was pretty amazing. Rain assists local governments with planning for hazards, especially threats from tornadoes. To help Dallas prepare for a possible mega disaster, he has modeled over 60 different scenarios of how the Dallas region would be affected by a violent tornado. For reasons of credibility, it was very important that we look at an event that actually had occurred somewhere else. So we took the, uh, the event in Oklahoma City basically because the data was very good for that particular event, and we could transpose it by just moving those same geographical characteristics of the tornado on top of the geography of Dallas-Fort Worth. So we got to see it kind of from our own perspective. Ray and his team painstakingly overlaid the exact path taken by the Oklahoma tornadoes over the Dallas-Fort Worth area. A mega disaster unfolds when Oklahoma's F5 tornado rampages through downtown Dallas. It would easily be the worst damaging tornado event that we have had to date in the US. Ray's nightmare scenario begins as a supercell storm forms over north central Texas. A 160 km per hour tornado, an F3, touches down in a dusty field 10 miles southwest of Dallas. Its first target is the suburb of Cockrell Hill. Packing winds in excess of 320 km per hour, cars are tossed aside, buildings are decimated. 
The tornado continues northeast, unrelenting in its assault on thousands of homes. The twister's internal wind speeds rise past 400 kilometers per hour, turning it into an F5. Fueled by tons of debris, the giant tornado slows as it descends on the busy freeway. A clogged highway holds a heck of a lot more people than one that is moving comfortably. And the other problem that you have is, um, where do you go? Panic ensues as many abandon their cars, creating a traffic jam that traps thousands. The 443 kilometer per hour winds effortlessly swat cars off the highway. Anyone hiding under an overpass is vulnerable to flying debris and violent winds. Cars snatched up by the powerful updraft winds are spun around inside the giant vortex, then shot out, creating a dangerous hazard for anyone in their path. Next, the deadly twister approaches downtown Dallas. Dozens of skyscrapers and tens of thousands of people crowd the city. Giant glass windows shatter. Marble and bricks are ripped off buildings. A deadly shower of glass and other debris rains down onto the crowd below. Most of the skyscrapers in the Dallas-Fort Worth area are predominantly covered with glass on the outside, and that's not very durable. But the amount of damage from getting wind and broken glass spread out through a downtown area is going to be pretty dramatic. A packed commuter train snakes through the city. It swept off the tracks and slammed into a skyscraper, killing hundreds in the train and office buildings. There's little doubt that debris would be uh, probably the largest generator of damage in the Metroplex, and it's basically because there's so much of it that can be generated, and you name it, it could be uh, wood, bricks, gravel, just about anything you can imagine can become a projectile. and and with uh, almost unlimited supply. The tornado continues north, leaving the wreckage of downtown Dallas behind. Tornadic winds more than 500 kilometers per hour now descend on the suburban landscape of Lakewood. The 92,000 people living here have had up to 20 minutes to seek underground shelter, a seemingly reasonable chance for survival. But like the Gerald Texas Twister, those hiding in closets or bathrooms can only pray. Finally, the worst tornado in history slowly drifts skyward and dissipates. The war zone behind it is 61 kilometers long. Dallas is devastated. I don't think there's there's any way to really sugarcoat an event. It's going to be difficult to deal with regardless. So there's going to be a lot of damage. There are going to be a lot of people that need help. Total damages approach $5 billion. Tens of thousands are homeless and scores injured. The death toll is unknown. Fatalities are difficult to really quantize because they involve people making decisions and there are good decisions that can be made, bad decisions. We don't know what decision they're going to make. The best decision city planners can make is to prepare with multiple underground shelters, rehearsed evacuation plans, and a vigilant public. But even that won't likely be enough. I think it would pretty much be impossible financially to build a city that could really survive violent class tornadoes or you know any scenario like that. With increasing populations in major metropolitan cities throughout Tornado Alley, science is in a life or death race against time to understand one of Mother Nature's biggest secrets. In an ideal world, we'd have radar or other instrument measurements on every tornado that occurs. In the practical world that we live in, that's just not going to happen. Okay, this storm in the next hour is going to produce this type of tornado. But we're just not there yet, and it's hard to say when we'll be there. We've certainly got a ways to go. Given the limited ability to predict tornadoes, there is a very real cause for concern. Most people think about disasters as very random events that can happen to them. And I think that holds true with tornadoes as well. If you wait long enough, something resembling the worst case scenario 
is going to happen eventually. Until science learns more about these brutal forces of nature, the only thing that can be done is to prepare before a mega-disaster strikes.